Hello, everyone. Welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, the 26th of September. Today's topic is eCyber Mission. Our special guest is Matt Hartman. Uh, I'm one of the show hosts, Lori Moffat, along with Peggy George and Tammy Moore. Thanks to Tammy for doing the closed captioning for us. And I'm going to turn the mic over to Melissa Getz, who will introduce Matt. Matt Harmon has been involved with science education for the past 15 years. He spent 10 years as a middle school and high school teacher and has been working the last four years with the National Science Teachers Association. He holds an MED from Penn State and certification in secondary earth and space science, general science, and K-12 environmental education in Pennsylvania. He currently resides in Pittsburgh, PA. Please go ahead. Well, hello, everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. And um, thank you to Classroom uh, 2.0 for having me. Uh, here as well to talk about East Cyber Mission. So uh, the first thing we're going to do here is uh, answer the newbie question, which is what is East Cyber Mission and why was it created? Um, what it is, I'm going to go into great depth about. Obviously, that's kind of what our entire session here is going to be about. But just in a nutshell, it is a STEM competition for students in grades 6, 7, 8, and 9 sponsored by the U.S. Army and administered by the National Science Teachers Association. And it was created by the U.S. Army to let students uh, or to expose students to scientific research methods and engineering principles in an interactive, hands-on way that enables them to compete for recognition, scholarships, uh, awards, and because the U.S. Army considers STEM education to be a national security issue. They hope to encourage American students to study and pursue STEM fields. So that is uh, essentially the reason why it was created. And as far as what it is, we'll get into more depth about that um, as we start off here. So uh, once again, welcome. And um, like I said, we're going to be talking about eCyber Mission. Uh, we'll be giving you a look at what's involved in the competition, tell you how you can get your students involved. Uh, we'll be talking about what you can do with eCyber Mission resources even if you are not uh, a 6 through 8 teacher, um, even if you are not a science teacher, and even if you are not uh, based in the U.S., if you don't have students who are U.S. citizens, you'll still be able to use a lot of the resources that we have available, um, even if you won't be able to participate in the competition directly. We'll look at some tips for some of the parts of the competition and make sure that you have everything that you would need if you do have students that you want to get involved and you'd like to see them succeed. We're going to begin by putting eCyber Mission into some context by telling you a little bit about the Army Educational Outreach Program. And uh, actually, let me just show you the agenda here. We'll talk a little bit about the AEOP Cooperative Agreement. I'll explain what that means in a second. We'll give you an overview of eCyber Mission, how the competition works, resources that teams can use. And we'll talk about volunteer opportunities as well for positions uh, that we have cyber guides, ambassadors, and virtual judges. We'll talk all about what those things are and what is involved with those. And then, of course, we'll have some time for questions at the end as well. So AEOP and the AEOP Cooperative Agreement. AEOP stands for um, the Army Educational Outreach Program. And it is essentially um, an organization within the Army that offers all sorts of different opportunities for students and teachers, um, students ranging all the way from elementary school up in through college. So there are competitions. There are events that they can attend. There are scholarships that they can apply for. And uh, as it says on here, they, AEOP essentially consolidated their programs. They involve different parts of the Army. Um, ASALT, which is the Assistant Secretary for the Army for Acquisition, Logistics, and Technology. RDECOM, Research Development and Engineering Command. 
MEDCOM, the Medical Command, USACE, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and USMA, the United States Military Academy, located at West Point. They're university partners as well, um, and there are actually some new partners uh, that are going to be involved in this coming um, fiscal year, which will start at the beginning of October here, but those have not been officially announced yet, and I don't even know exactly who they are, but um, we're all very much looking forward to finding out who we're going to be working with. So let's talk about uh, what eCyberMission is in a little more depth here. eCyberMission focuses on science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, or as you may know, it's STEM. The competition is sponsored, as I said, by the U.S. Army, administered by the National Science Teachers Association, and there is no charge to students in grades 6 through 9 to participate. Students do not need to pay a registration fee to compete in the program or anything along those lines. The program focuses, as I said, on STEM. Currently, there's a high need for STEM workers. Um, the U.S. Army is committed to bringing about an awareness of the STEM field, and they want to make the fields fun and exciting, and they feel that this interest and commitment today will lead to jobs based in those fields in the future for students. Now, as you may have guessed, eCyber Mission is web-based. Uh, thus the E at the beginning there. It has online tools and webinars to help students and their team advisors through the process. All the submissions are also done via electronic means. So you can think of it kind of as a virtual science fair where only the judges are seeing the team submissions. And of course, there are rewards. Students who place first at the state level can advance to the regional and national competitions and have an opportunity to win up to $9,000 in maturity value in U.S. savings bonds. Now, it's also important to note that eCyberMission is a team competition. Teams can be comprised of three or four students who are in the same grade and in the same state. But students do not have to go to the same school. So if you're the leader of a community group like Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, 4-H, uh, homeschool co-op, anything along those lines, you can register a team as well. So it's not required that the students all attend the same school, just that they live in the same state and that the members on a team are in the same grade. So looking at the prizes that we have available, as we said here, there are uh, cash prize, not cash prizes, but rather savings bond prizes. Uh, each state winner in each grade receives $1,000 in U.S. savings bonds, 500 if they're in second place. And this is, again, maturity value. Each member of a re regional finalist team uh, will get another $1,000 in U.S. savings bonds. Uh, the regional finalist teams are the top three teams from every region. There are five regions around the U.S. So they're selected, and once they're selected as a regional finalist, they win an additional $1,000 each. And remember, that is per student. Each of the five regional winners in each grade receives an additional $2,000 in U.S. savings bonds, again, maturity value. And they get an all-expense-paid trip to the Washington, D.C. area, usually in mid to late June, to compete for the national award. And each of the national winners receives $5,000 in U.S. savings bonds in maturity value. So that money is given to the students, um, and they are welcome to use it in whichever way they would like. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to go back one quick second to let you know that since 2002, the U.S. Army has awarded more than $9 million in uh, U.S. savings bonds to students. So um, quite a bit of prize money has gone out there. And that, that is when the, uh, the program came um, into existence was 2001-2002. So we consider this an opportunity of a lifetime for students and one that can jumpstart their careers and really their interest in science in general. Uh, there were only 30 exhibits at the White House Science Fair this year, and eCyber Mission was one of them. Now, as you know, President Obama has spearheaded a charge to increase students' interest and participation in STEM education, and eCyberMission is proud to follow that same mission. While not all eCyberMission participants or even all of the winners will get to meet the president, the competition does open doors and show students the many opportunities that are out there for them. 
Lisa Jackson, who is the head of the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, sought out an eCyber Mission team at the White House Science Fair in 2012 because of their interest in the environment and her interest in minorities. One of the teams that went to that um, science fair was Hispanic. They had learned to speak English in middle school. And she provided them with opportunities in state EPA offices. Now the opportunities that the students receive after being part of eCyber Mission gives them confidence to go on and do things that they may not thought were possible before. Again, I do want to point out that not every winning team gets to go to the White House or be part of the White House Science Fair, but there are teams that are selected from time to time based on the decision of the White House. When a team participates in eCyber Mission, they must submit a mission folder. The mission folder is our online submission tool. Think of it as a very robust lab report. Uh, these are the questions that the students are answering about the work that they have done in their project. It's divided into three main sections, team collaboration, use of engineering design process, or the use of scientific inquiry, and the benefit to the community. So the students are actually choosing to either take a scientific path or an engineering path in order to solve a community-based problem. Now the team collaboration section is a chance for the team to discuss how they work together, the organization of their group, specific tasks that they each performed. The benefits of the community section allows the team members to explain exactly how their experiment benefits the community. Both of these sections are extremely important for the mission folder. You can see from the scoring breakdown here on this little pie chart, they're worth significant points. But most of the points from the mission folder come from the application of scientific inquiry using scientific practices or the application of the engineering design process section. So let's take a look at how the competition will work here. First of all, the students need to form teams. Uh, teams, as I mentioned before, are three or four students. Can't be less than three, can't be more than four. Those students, again, have to be in the same grade and have to live in the same state. So if you're in a school uh, that works with students in multiple states, the students can register in the state that the school is located. But each team must be made up of students that, again, are in the same grade due to the way that the projects are judged and the prizes are awarded. The first step is obviously for the uh, team advisor, and that would be someone like you, an adult that needs to be a part of the team. Uh, they would need to register, and then each of the students would register, and they would link to that team advisor through our system. It's done on the website at www.ecybermission.com. And if you need help with that, you can always contact Mission Control. That's our help desk, our help system. We'll have an um, email address here for you. It's just missioncontrol at eCyberMission.com. We'll have that up here a little bit later for you. Um, and there's also a phone number that you can call Monday through Friday. So once the students are registered, uh, they then choose a problem that they want to try to solve in their community. Our goal is to get all kids to see STEM as more than just building a robot or building a bridge or putting on a lab coat. As we mentioned earlier, students are going to pick a topic that uh, is a problem that affects their community, something that's meaningful to them. So they're dealing with real world problems and finding solutions to those problems. It's important to note, though, that no testing on vertebrates can be done as part of the eCyber Mission competition without the approval of an Institutional Review Board, or an IRB, as they are known. This is a group that can certify that the testing that's being done will not cause harm. If an external IRB isn't available to you, you can actually set up your own IRB at your school, and we have documentation that can help with that. But any project that is submitted with testing on vertebrates, including any tests done on humans, having people taste things, drinking stuff, exercising to some degree, whatever, that doesn't have IRB approval and doesn't have an IRB approval form attached to it, which again, we provide, uh, that project would be disqualified. We're very, very concerned about making sure that the projects are safe, not just for the students, 
but also for any of the subjects that are being tested. Now, when students are identifying the problem that they wish to address, they will then categorize that problem into a set of what we call mission challenges. Mission challenges are the possible categories into which students' scientific investigation or engineering design must fall. This year, the mission challenges are listed here, the alternative energy sources, environment, food, health, and fitness, forces and motion, national security and safety, robotics, and technology. So you can see here, it's a very wide range. So if students come up with a particular problem, they're probably going to be able to find a way to fit it into one of these categories. Important to note that the judging is not based on the category. So it is not only environmental projects against other environmental projects. Students are being judged based on the grade that they are in. So we use this to help focus the students and to try to get them into a particular area so that they are you know, looking in the right places. We'll also talk a little bit later about our cyber guides. Cyber guides are experts in particular fields. So when we have these categories, we tell the cyber guides, pick one, two, three, however many of these categories you would feel comfortable answering questions in. That way, when the students are looking for support and looking for help, they'll know who to go to. After choosing a problem, the team will apply scientific inquiry using scientific practices or end the engineering design process. If they choose the scientific inquiry route, they will write a problem statement, develop a hypothesis, and through research and experiments, work toward a proposed solution. For the engineering design process, they'll develop a problem statement, experimental design, build and test a prototype, and then draw conclusions. Student teams will answer questions about how they use the scientific inquiry using scientific practices or engineering design and how they work as a team to complete their project. They submit their answers again in the online mission folder, which is the official write up there. They can also attach files like pictures, videos, survey questions, links. We encourage students to conduct surveys as they're an excellent way to collect data. But note that a survey approval form, a lot like our IRB approval form, must be submitted with a mission folder if a survey is completed as part of the project. Any mission folder that contained data from a survey that did not have a survey approval form would be disqualified. What's important to note about eCyberMission is that students aren't judged on whether or not they solve the problem. They're judged on the process that they went through, and they're right up in that mission folder. So finding an actual answer, finding an actual solution to the problem, that's not necessary 100% in order for them to actually move forward or for them to win prizes. The process that they went through is what we're looking at. You can find a deeper explanation of these two different paths here, scientific inquiry and engineering design, um, in the resource section of our eCyberMission website. But just in a nutshell, the scientific inquiry process involves making observations, asking questions that can be answered using experimentation. Engineering design involves identifying a specific problem and developing a solution to that problem through design of a device of some kind. Let's take a look here at the timeline, general timeline for eCyberMission. Now, as you can see from the timeline here, virtual judging uh, begins in March. So students must submit their mission folder no later than 11.59 p.m. on February 29th, 2016. This year, that's our date. This will require all members of the team to make sure that they have reviewed their mission folder, that everything is ready to go, and then the team advisor will go in, answer a few questions about the start date of the project, they'll make sure that the IRB approval form is there if it needs to be, the, serval, the survey approval form, excuse me, is there if it needs to be, and then they will submit the mission folder, and they will also have to sign off saying that um, everything was conducted in a safe manner, that the project was done specifically by the students without uh, outside help. We do 
obviously support is excellent, but we don't want our teachers and parents and team advisors to be writing the mission folder for the students. We want to see the students work here. Uh, here are some examples of some winning projects from eCyberMission. And you can see that there's a wide variety of different projects that happen. Uh, and that are submitted. We had a team that was trying to solve the problems of topsoil being blown away in the community, one that was trying to reduce the amount of phantom electricity that's wasted, trying to develop a quick, easy, cost-effective way to sanitize drinking water in underdeveloped countries and disaster areas, trying to solve the problem created by floodwaters, trying to improve air quality in the school, trying to design a keyboard that will help reduce cases of carpal tunnel syndrome. So when we say that we're addressing a problem that affects the community, community can be defined in several different ways. We can talk about community as the classroom. We can talk about it as the school. Then we can go to the neighborhood, the town, the state. We can even get to the country and even actually the world we can look at it because in this particular case, some of these problems affect people in other parts of the world. That's okay if students are looking at that as a problem they would want to try to solve. So we have a lot of different resources for team advisors, for folks that are just starting out, also for folks that have been doing this for years and for the students. One is the Mission Control Help Desk. I mentioned Mission Control before. We have a 1866 number there, toll free. It's 1-866-GO-CYBER. And that phone line is staffed Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Also, emails can be sent to Mission Control at missioncontrol at ecybermission.com. Uh, those obviously are answered at the first uh, available point when uh, we can answer those. So if it's after 5 p.m. Eastern time on a particular day, on a weekday, or if it's during the weekend, you're probably not going to hear until the next business day. There are also mission folder tips. Um, we have worksheets and tools that will help students online. We have virtual lessons for uh, if you are um, having these students do work outside of class and you don't have time to go through a particular part of you know, how should you write a problem statement or how should you come up with a hypothesis. We have virtual lessons online for that that students can view um, away from school or outside of class and then there are worksheets provided with that for them to go through as well. So we have all sorts of different um, lesson plans available and timelines and rubrics for you to use so that you can go through and uh, grade these projects exactly the same way that the judges will be going through and scoring points. We talked about the Mission Control Helpline. Um, we can also connect the students to cyber guides. These are subject matter experts that will help answer questions about projects, about experimental processes, and the experts are volunteers that are cleared through mili military background checks and they are dedicated to science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So these are experts that students can access through our website, through our um, chat forums, and also through specific uh, chat rooms, team talk that we use in there as well. And eCyberMission, of course, wouldn't be a very good online uh, competition if it wasn't involved in social media of some way. And of course we are. Uh, we have a Facebook page, Twitter accounts, there's YouTube, SchoolTube, Flickr. Uh, you can add us if you'd like to, if you'd like to be our friend or like us or anything along those lines. And we use these networks to present our users daily with blog articles and posts and um, we have teams posting on there about what they're working on and what they're doing, and they put photos up. So it's a really, it's a great way for uh, people outside of the competition to see what is going on with eCyberMission and how all of it works. So along with the competition teams and the roles that we have for the team advisor and the students, 
eCyber Mission Competition also requires the help of volunteers. There are four different volunteer roles in the competition. I mentioned these very way back at the beginning there, the ambassadors, the cyber guides, virtual judges, and student virtual judges. So we'll take a look at each of these and we'll start off with ambassadors. An objective of East Cyber Mission as a nationwide competition is to achieve participation from every state and territory in the country. As frontline volunteers, the primary task for ambassadors is to promote the competition through outreach and marketing efforts. The ambassador role includes promoting eCyber Mission to teachers, parents, schools, and this includes Department of Defense educational activity schools, which are not located in the U.S. but are on military bases throughout the world, and other interested individuals or organizations across the nation to stimulate interest and motivate students to participate in the competition, to promote eCyber Mission at key conferences and meetings, to promote eCyber Mission volunteer opportunities within their community and workplaces, to communicate the Army's vision to give back to the youth of America, to report on all outreach efforts conducted with all audiences, and encourage other individuals to become eCyber Mission volunteers. As with all of the volunteer roles, the first step in becoming an ambassador will be to head over to the eCyberMission.com website. That's where you can register to become an ambassador or really any of the volunteer roles or students can register or team advisors can register. And it's also where you will interface with the program once you are registered. Once you log in after your registration, you'll find information about your role, your responsibilities, and all of the tools at your disposal. As an ambassador, you'll be able to assign yourself specific schools, school districts, and community organizations that you will reach out to this year. And if you're ever having trouble coming up with which ones you would sign up for and which ones you'd want to reach out for, you can contact our volunteer program coordinator and they can give you a suggested list for the area that you're in. Next, you would then conduct outreach with the schools and districts and community groups. You can do that via email, phone calls, face-to-face -face meetings. And keep in mind that if there are groups or individuals in the area that might be interested in this competition, you can contact them as well. The more, the merrier. You'll also be creating an outreach log for each contact you have. And remember, at any time, you can request more promotional materials from eCyber Mission. We have tons of materials just waiting to get into the hands of interested individuals and groups, and you as an ambassador would be the conduit to that. So you can just let us know what you need, and we would get it to you. Some of the resources available for the ambassadors include the ambassador homepage. Um, this is once you log in, you get your username and password, and the homepage lets you search for schools, school districts, assign the schools, and then report your visits through your outreach logs. We have an ambassador's user's guide. This is, serves as information resource for all the different roles and responsibilities that you have as an ambassador. An outreach log for each school, school district, and community group you select is available on your My Assignments page, which you would see on your home page. You click on the Outreach Log when you assign your school on the website. You'll use this to document all the contacts that you make. There's also What's New, a press room, where there's updated news about eCyber Mission when that's announced. Volunteer program emails coming from the volunteer program coordinator to provide up-to-date information about the competition and tips for outreach and upcoming events and deadlines. Frequently asked questions. Uh, this is a section where obviously any questions that you might have could be in the frequently asked questions. And if they aren't, you can of course contact the volunteer coordinator or mission control at any time to get some answers for you there. So this is the all of these roles, all these volunteer roles are open to anybody over the age of 18 that is a US citizen and would like to be involved in the program, but doesn't necessarily have a class, isn't necessarily a 6th through ninth grade teacher, or doesn't work with any 6th through ninth grade students. So let's talk a little bit about cyber guides. I mentioned before that these are volunteers who are subject matter experts. So cyber guides communicate with the teams to encourage and motivate them to discover the applications and relevance of STEM. 
Their roles and responsibilities include providing teams with research assistance, encouraging the teams to stay involved, including using positive and encouraging tone while you're talking with the students, quickly, enthusiastically responding to the requests for assistance, coaching and mentoring teams, signing up to lead a CyberGuide webinar where we have uh, opportunity for the teachers and the students to get online and actually talk directly to a CyberGuide, ask them questions that they might have. Serving as a feedback channel, including communicating input on the competition. And private chat room requests, because students and teams often request private chat with a CyberGuide, and we can facilitate that through our website as well. So while the team advisors work with the students on their projects, cyber guides provide subject matter assistance that's invaluable to the success of the team's mission folders. Remember that team advisors aren't necessarily STEM teachers. You don't have to be a STEM teacher in order to be a team advisor. You just have to be over the age of 18 and be willing to work with the students and have a connection to the students of some kind. Be a teacher of theirs, be a parent of one of the students on the team, something along those lines. The, the head of a community group, something along like that. But because not all the team advisors are STEM teachers, uh, they are going to need even more support when it comes to subject matter. And even some of the some teams that are led by STEM teachers, they'll need a real world perspective. So regardless of the expertise of the team advisor, the cyber guides contributions provide a different perspective and add expertise to the way that students conduct their research and their experiments. Cyber guides have an important role to keep teams motivated and interested in the competition. When interacting with teams, it's important to remember that they need cyber guides to always stay positive and inspirational. Some teams may become discouraged, and the influence of a cyber guide to encourage them to continue is very important especially for students that you sense may be struggling with their mission folder or maybe even with their teammates. An important goal of the competition also is to motivate teams to discover how STEM education can impact their everyday lives. This discovery process will inspire many of them to explore further academic studies or even careers in those fields which is a major reason for the U.S. Army to sponsor the competition. Of course, cyber guides should use their discretion in determining how to help teams on a case-by-case -case basis, but we ask them to keep the importance of the discovery process and the equity and services provided to various teams in mind. We also have some brainstorming tips that we give to the cyber guides as well to help them figure out uh, how to help the students to choose a mission challenge, perhaps, or to uh, pursue the particular challenge that they are looking at. We also ask each cyber guide to provide a biography. Students and teams will often contact Mission Control to obtain feedback or guidance from a cyber guide. So the cyber guide biographies allow students to choose an online mentor that closely aligns with their mission challenge. When teams reach out to Mission Control to connect with a cyber guide, the volunteer program coordinates a time for the team and the cyber guide to meet in that private chat room. During these sessions, cyber guides can provide feedback and guidance to students and answer general questions about a team's mission folder. So both of those roles, the ambassador and the cyber guide, most of their work is done during the time that the competition is running, generally from around September, well, August, mid-August, until the end of February. At that point, cyber guides, uh, their job is going to be done. For the ambassadors, their job can go year-round if they like. Um, a lot of the work is being done be right before the competition starts and then during the competition itself. The next role, the virtual judges, their job starts sort of when the rest of the work ends. Since eCyberMission is web-based, all the judging at the state level is done online. For that purpose, we need virtual judges. These are folks who log on to the website, actually read through and score the mission folders. Virtual judges come from a variety of backgrounds. We have educators, STEM professionals, military leaders. So at registration, virtual judges create a login name and a password they'll use to access the judging portal. 
that's where they find all their judging assignments, their tools, a user's guide, and any additional information that they may need. When virtual judges click on mission folder judging assignments, they're taken to a screen that looks a lot like this. I apologize for the small size on this. The first time that they log in, it will show them how many folders they've scored out of the total number of folders that have been assigned. Now, as you can see here, if you can make it out, uh, this judge has been busy and has already scored 40 out of an assigned 45 folders. When virtual judges have completed their assigned folders, they can always ask for more. Now, 45 is not the number of folders that is immediately assigned to a virtual judge. It would be somewhere more in the neighborhood of 10. But they can, of course, add more folders on as they go. So if they do that, they have a chance to do more judging. Each mission folder is actually evaluated five times by five separate judges. These assignments are automated, I'm sorry, the assignments of the, the folders are automated to ensure fairness. Virtual judges should anticipate judging a variety of grades and topics. But before they even open a mission folder, they know what method, the mission, the grade that the current assignment is. Mission folders are displayed with all the information needed to evaluate the folder. Each section of the mission folder appears with the original questions as well as the team's response and any supporting documents that they may have included, like in this example here where the team attached a chart and a graph. There's also the judging criteria and a point scale for reference on each question. Judges may save scores at any time and return to them to, as they evaluate a mission folder. Virtual judges are able to log in at any time of day from any computer during the judging period to judge, which makes this sort of a great opportunity for volunteers that have a more flexible schedule or maybe a more rigid schedule. Uh, you don't need to be doing this during the day. You can do it when you get home at night or you can do it on the weekends uh, or you can do it in the morning right before classes start or anything like that. The eCyber Mission Virtual Judge website offers many additional tools that allow the user to track and measure their progress during judging. One such tool allows judges to review the folders that they have completed, as well as the scores that they've given them for comparative measures. There are many tools in the virtual judging portal. The mission folder judging assignments are what I just went over. There are also the discussion forum, a place where you can chat with other virtual judges about their experiences. The virtual judges user guide, which is an official guide to being an eCyber Mission virtual judge. Mission Minutes, which is a monthly volunteer newsletter. Scoring Help, tips on how to score mission folders and help improve the ability of a judge to come to an accurate score. And of course, frequently asked questions. We recognize that some of the best virtual judges out there are those in the classroom right now. That is why we offer a student virtual judge program for college students who wish to volunteer as a virtual judge. Students have their own judging portal with specialized tools to meet their busy academic schedules. eCyberMission Virtual Judging is a great way for STEM college students and pre-service teachers to engage in a critical examination of the scientific and engineering principles and apply them to a real-life application. Providing positive feedback to the eCyberMission competition teams also allows the opportunity for student virtual judges to draw on their own experiences. And again, the flexibility of the virtual judging program makes it a great opportunity for honor students, fraternities, sororities, or any student looking to gain professional experience to start a resume. So, what is the next step for you if you are interested in getting involved in the program? Well, first thing you would want to do is head over to www.ecybermission.com and uh, that's where you can obviously access all of the resources that we have. You can get a review of everything I've just gone over here. All of our rules are listed there. All of the roles are listed as well. And the registration is now open for students, team advisors, 
virtual judges, cyber guides, ambassadors. So if you're interested in that, you can head over there, like I said. If you want to contact us because you have specific questions, 1-866-GO-CYBER. That's a phone number that you can call 9 to 5 Eastern Time, Monday through Friday. Or email us at missioncontrol at ecybermission.com. Uh, that is another place that you can get some of your questions answered. Speaking of questions, I know we're going to start those in just a moment here. I'll be happy to answer any of the questions that have come up uh, in the chat. I know they've been uh, saved for me over here, so I'm sure there's a bunch. Uh, and if there's any more that you think of, obviously. And if you don't, if you think of a question later, obviously, again, contact Mission Control, um, and we'll be happy to answer any of the questions that you have. But I want to thank you all, uh, before I even get to answering those questions, for taking the time to be with us here today, for listening to my presentation about eCyber Mission. Also, if you are not a 6th through ninth grade teacher, but you're thinking, I like the sound of this program, I like the types of things that are going on here, there are other AEOP programs available, as I said, for students from elementary school all the way up into college. So what you can do is, if you go to www.usaeop.com, you can find out about all the different competitions and programs and scholarship opportunities for students there as well. And one of the other things I want to point out real quickly here before I move into questions is, if you are a teacher who is not based in the U.S. and you do not have students that are U.S. citizens, you can still go to our website. You can still access all of the resources that we have available. So while you will not be able to participate in the competition and compete for the prize money, what you will be able to do is access all of the resources, the lesson plans, the online lessons, the rubrics. You can very easily have your students complete the same types of projects that students are doing through the eCyber Mission competition to get them engaged in STEM, to have them working on real life problems. All of the questions are available that are in the mission folder. Everything is there for you. So while you can't participate and can't compete, you can still access all those resources and you can still use this same, same stuff that's being used for this project. So with that being said, um, I have reached the end of my uh, prepared presentation here. Let's go into the question and answer portion. Let's try this again. Um, first question I captured, are students able to use those savings bonds to help pay for college tuition? Uh, absolutely. Those savings bonds, as I mentioned, can be used for whatever the students or the students' parents uh, think that they should be used for. So um, as I said, the value of those savings bonds is maturity value. The bonds are purchased at half of the maturity value, and then they mature at whatever rate happens to be the rate at which they are maturing. So the students, they are in the student's name. Um, they are uh, in an account that is for the students, essentially. So they would be able to withdraw them when they would like, uh, but if they withdraw them before they mature all the way, they're going to be at whatever value they're they're currently at. But yes, they can use those right. savings bonds and that money t uh, in any way they wish. Okay. Um, does the problem have to be an original one for eCyber Mission, uh, a problem that hasn't been addressed before? So uh, that's an interesting question because um, the, the general answer is yes, this does need mm -hmm. to be an original problem. But we do find that there are teams, we have teams from all over the country doing this. Last year we had over 4,000 teams submit. Are there going to be teams that wind up trying to solve the same problem that other teams did? Of course. Are there going to be teams that tried to solve the same problem that teams did in the past? Yes, obviously. What we do not want are teams that are going in and uh, replicating the exact work of a previous winning team, for instance, mm -hmm. or going in and um, 
working on a project that they have, um, or submitting a project rather, that they have been working on longer than uh, just the current competition year. Um, their projects have to start in April of the previous year or after in order to be eligible for this current competition year. So um, does it have to be a totally original problem? It should be. Uh, is it always going to be completely original and something that's never been uh, you know, asked or faced before? Probably not, but if it is, but we definitely encourage that. Okay. Uh, do schools or teams tend to do this as an after school time activity or during the school day? That's an excellent question. And um, again, it is very much up to the team advisor how they'd like to do that. We have teams that are specifically an extracurricular activity and after school activity. We have other teams where the teachers have implemented this straight into the classroom. So they have e-cyber mission Fridays where every Friday the students are working on their projects. So it's very much up to the, the teacher or the team advisor how they would like to run this. Um, we've seen success, success both ways. We have entire school districts that have implemented this into their middle school science curriculum. We have schools where there is one team advisor that has three students, they meet after school and they work on it. So it's a very wide range of ways that this can be done with the lesson plans we provide, the rubrics, all the different resources, um, there is a way to integrate this into the classroom. But one of the issues that teachers always run into, I know that I always ran into when I was teaching, is time. Mm -hmm. uh, how much time do I have that I, can, that I can add this new thing to it? So if that does become an issue, um, having uh, work that the students can do outside of the classroom um, definitely helps with something like that. Right. And speaking of time, how much in, how much time in general would it take to complete an entire project from start to finish? That is very much going to depend on the project. Um, mm -hmm. We have had teams that have uh, started working on this, as I said, it, as soon as they could, April of the previous year, and they've worked all the way up right until the deadline. Mm -hmm. We've had teams that have uh, spent a um, a month working on their project. We've had teams that have spent one day, um, not one day total, but um, one day a week for a month working on their projects. So it really does vary. Um, we have some resources for team advisors called the, the Team Advisor uh, User Guide. It's available on our website. And there are, in, at the back of that, there are reflections done by previous team advisors from national winning teams. They talk a little bit about the amount of time that they worked on their projects, how they set up their schedules and things like that. I definitely advise anybody who's going to do this, head over, look at that document because the, the words of the people who have actually won this competition are the ones that you're going to want to heed. Mm -hmm. Is there a list of problems that students can start with? Sometimes they can't think of original problems that need to be solved? Sure. Um, we do not have a list like that. And mm -hmm. that's by design. One of the things right. we don't want to be doing is influencing students as to what they should, what problems they should be facing. But sure. absolutely, that is a problem, certainly with middle school students. Um, figuring out a problem to solve, and then uh, even if they have several problems, picking the one that they want to try to solve. Mm -hmm. So what we do have are resources that will help students to do that. We have um, some brainstorming activities. Uh, we have some uh, lessons that are specifically called choosing a problem. Um, one of the things, uh, and I'll just give you a, a brief example of one of the, the ways that um, a team advisor that I spoke to did it. Uh, she actually had the students looking um, for a couple of class periods um, into newspapers, into um, scientific journals, science magazines, things like that, going through finding issues that they mm -hmm. saw in those actual things, and then writing a little, you know, a little abstract about that article and about that problem, using those types of things to inspire them to come up with problems. Because a lot of times, you're absolutely correct, when we just go to students and say, well, what's a problem that you'd like to face? You know, they, 
they don't even know where to start with that. So really taking them step by step through that process, showing them here are the resources, here are some places to look for issues and things that are going on in your community or in the world, and then allowing them to kind of pick and narrow down like, oh, okay, well, I find that really interesting. Let's, let's pursue that. Um, and sometimes we have to steer them in another direction because sometimes the problem that they're trying to face is a little too large or a little too general. If a student said, I want to stop global warming, that's very noble. That's great. Uh, but unfortunately, it's a little big for something like this that you're going to be doing in a month, or not a month, rather a couple of months or something like that. That type of project, you would want to focus it on what aspects of global warming you're looking at. How, you know, how does global warming work? Okay, what could we reduce here, maybe just in our classroom or in, in our school? Mm -hmm. Do you have to be a U.S. citizen to be an ambassador? Yes, you do need to be a U.S. citizen to fill any of the roles that we have um, um, in the cyber mission competition. Mm -hmm. uh, can a teacher take a classroom lab and turn it into an e-cyber mission entry? Um, that's an interesting question. So I'm not sure exactly how they would go about that. They could certainly right. use it as inspiration. Um, but if a, if a teacher was presenting students with um, a lab that was step by step, what I, what I kind of call like a sort of a cookbook lab, um, that would not be something that they could submit as a project because right. students, part of the, the competition is uh, developing their own experiments and developing their own procedures. So if something like that already existed, it would be difficult to do. Now, if a teacher had a lab uh, that let's say they just presented a particular problem and then students were developing their own ways of trying to solve that problem or to answer a particular question, uh, that I could see being used um, for submission to the, to the competition. But keep in mind, you wouldn't want your entire class, if you divided your class into three or four teams or five or six teams, to all be submitting the same project, uh, to even all be addressing the same problem probably. You want them to be doing different problems. Sure. All right, Melissa, I'm going to turn the mic over to you and you can tell us about your virtual judging experience. Thank you. Um, I've been a virtual judge for a couple of years. It was very eye-opening. Uh, my background is as a high school uh, science teacher and when I saw what middle school and freshmen are doing, it, it just it blew me away. It is, it is really inspirational to see what middle schoolers are doing. Um, and, and it's eye-opening to, to see what needs to be done with teaching of science. Yeah, I recommend, if, if you have the time, I recommend being a virtual judge. Um, you don't have to, like I said, you don't have to be a, a grade 6 through 9 teacher to do it. You could be anybody. That's correct. And I'd like to add to that also that if you do think you have any sort of um, desire to be, if you are a 6 or 9 teacher and you're thinking, oh, this might be something I'd like to do, being a virtual judge will give you a very good idea of the types of projects and the types of problems that, that students are working on and the quality of the, the projects that are being submitted. So you'll be able to see sort of, you know, behind the scenes a little bit on the, uh, on the competition. And uh, I'm sorry, Melissa, you had a question that came in the chat there. Time. That's a good question, and I, I'm, I'm not really sure because I would do my 10 papers, and then at the end they're, they're, they send you a little email saying, oh, we just have a few more to do, and, and it, it gets pretty exciting. Um, and you say, okay, I'll do more. And so it, because I choose to, I spend more time on it than the minimal number that they've asked you to do. Um, I also tend to really get into it. So where in some places someone might just cursory read through it, I read through things and, um, oh yeah, once you're comfortable, it does go much faster. But I will read through things and I'll be like, what are they thinking? And so then I will go through and I'll try to figure out how did they get this information and I, I think I may go into the grading process a little bit more 
then you have to. I, I tend to get really involved with with being a judge. We are not allowed to contact the participants. In fact, we don't even know their names. Um, they, it, it's an accident. If anyone's name ever comes through on something, it's only by accident. I, I, the only reason I figure out where something happens is because they're doing, literally doing a community issue. I think I read a project where kids were trying to figure out which muscles, um, not in the body, these are the, the aquatic, aquatic animals, muscles in, in their local bay, why they were overrunning the bay or why they were even there. And that's, that was, it was amazing. It was amazing to read that. Yeah those muscles. Um, and the fact that they went into and were trying to understand why they were there and how to, how they could be controlled. And that's the only reason I knew where that one was located, because it literally was a community issue. Yeah, we try very hard to, uh, to make sure that, the, um, that the, the mission folders are anonymous. So if we see a mission folder that does have uh, names in it, we will try to um, either take those out or uh, obscure them in some way so that the judges are not aware just in case they happen to know one of the participants and that would influence them in some way. But just so that you're all aware, the way that the judging works for virtual judging, that's all done, that's the state level. Once the students uh, pass the state level and go to the regional level, they are on, um, actually they use Blackboard Collaborate. Uh, to speak with the regional judges. So the regional judges do get to ask them questions about their projects. And then at the national judging, it's a little more like your traditional science fair. If you picture a room with um, booths set up and the students are there and the judges walk around and speak to them and talk to them. So the students are presenting at the regional judging phase and the national judging phase uh, directly to those judges. Um, but those judges are volunteers that come from uh, the U.S. Army specifically. Well, thanks so much, Matt and Melissa. Um, those were the questions I was able to gather. I'll turn the mic over to Peggy for the upcoming shows. Well, thank you, Matt, and Melissa, too. Very informative, and you've just answered all of our questions, and now we have all of those resources together in the live binder, so we can all go back and check again. So I hope that you'll all come back again. Um, our next show next weekend is going to be all about Bunsi. And if you haven't heard about that amazing tool, you're going to want to come and hear from these teachers. The October 10th show will be about Minecraft EDU. And on October 17th, we're going to hear from Jennifer Garcia about digital storytelling with iPads. Really looking forward to that. Then on October 24th, we won't have a show because that's the day of the DEN virtual conference. And that's always amazing, and we always like to go participate in that. So October 31st, though, we have a great featured teacher coming to share with us. Marcy Hebert will be our featured teacher, and she's going to be sharing all about maker spaces. And just a couple of words about Connected Educator Month. It's coming up. It's the entire month of October. So make sure you go to that site, get signed up. It's all free. And there are daily activities going on all month long related to education and being connected educators. And the fall virtual conference for DEN is in the live binder, so be sure to check that out and get signed up because, again, it's free, but you have to sign up so you can get the links to join the sessions. So be sure to do that. And Lori, I'm just going to turn this back to you to wrap up our final slides. Great. Uh, the Learning Revolution Project is Steve Hargadon's latest endeavor. He's gathered together all of his professional development resources at one place, including host your own webinar. And you can sign up for a Blackboard Collaborate room 
for an event of your own as long as you make the session public, the session's free. You can nominate a featured teacher by filling out the form at this site. There's also a tab in the, in the live binder as well for the month. Uh, it, you can nominate yourself as a featured teacher as well. We've got a featured teacher every month. When you exit the session today, the Classroom 2.0 Live survey ought to open. You can take the link in the chat box as well or the tab in the live binder. So there's three places on this slide that get you to the survey. Once you do complete the survey at the bottom, there are two fields to request a professional development certificate. The certificate now comes to you with your name pre-printed on it. Uh, please make sure you use a personal email address to request this. School email clients tend to block these certificates from arriving to your email account. There's also a video and audio collection on iTunes U of past shows and an RSS feed link on the Classroom 2.0 Live site. So there are many ways to get access to previous shows. Special thanks again to Matt Hartman, our special guest today, as well as Melissa Getz, to Steve Harkadon, the founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education and the Learning Revolution, to Weebly.com for providing our website, to Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform, and to everyone who participated in the show today, thank you so much for coming.